Good morning and welcome to uh, the third week of our Bible Expositions through the book of 1 Timothy. Let us pray as we begin. Lord, thank you so much for your sacrificial and atoning death on the cross through which you ransomed your people and purchased your church. Lord, if we are yours, then you have the right to direct how we must conduct ourselves even in your household. Will you therefore cause us to sustain listening ears to your word this morning and enable us to respond in obedience, not just when it is easy, but even the more when it seems inconvenient. Will you challenge us to pray for all people and challenge the ladies amongst us to dress modestly and to learn quietly with all submissiveness in the local congregation. Amen. Now, we continue with our expositions through the book of 1 Timothy, and today we'll be going through chapter 1, verse 18, to chapter 2, verse 15. As we all know, Paul wrote this letter to let Timothy know that everyone should conduct themselves in the household of God in true godliness that springs from the sound doctrine, and to teach everyone to conduct themselves in this manner. Having seen the genuineness of Paul's faith, the authenticity of his ministry and the authority of his apostleship in chapter 1 verse 1 to uh, verse 17. Today we begin this section where we will be seeing the practical ways of conducting ourselves in the household of God which is the local congregation. The main questions will be how should men and women conduct themselves in the local congregation? How should they pray and dress and learn. As we will find out, God's people must pray for all people with the sincerity and the purity of the heart that they may lead a peaceful and quiet life. We will also find out that women must dress modestly and they must learn quietly with all submissiveness. The main idea for our passage will therefore be God's people must pray for all people as the women dress modestly and learn quietly with all submissiveness. God's people must pray for all people as the women dress modestly and learn quietly with all submissiveness. Now, since this is a model exposition, let me make two comments. One, we know the situation that prompted the writing of this letter and the reason why Paul wrote it. We will therefore seek to ask ourselves how this passage contributes to and fits into the author's purpose. Now this is what we must be doing with every passage in the Bible. And the second thing, we must strive in our expositions to remain faithful to the text in their context, even if they say things that are countercultural, provided that those countercultural things are rooted not on the culture of that time, but on God's perfect order and universal plan for his people. Now with these two in mind, let's read the passage before us. That is 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 18 to chapter 2 verse 15. And I will be reading from ESV. Uh, this is what the Bible says. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith. Among them are Himanias and Alexander, whom I have, eh, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings, and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the right time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. 
I am telling the truth. I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger and quarreling. Likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good deed, with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet, she will be saved through childbearing if she continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. And that is the word of God. Now, the passage before us begins by Paul entrusting a charge to Timothy in accordance with the prophecies previously made about him, that by them he may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. The charge uh, seems to be so crucial that by rejecting it, some people, including Hymenaeus and Alexander, had made shipwreck of their faith. The charge could mean the one in chapter 1 verse 3, where we saw that Timothy was to charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. The charge could also mean that that one of teaching everyone to conduct themselves in the household of God in true godliness that springs from the sound doctrine. Now, if this is the case, then chapter 1 verse 18 to verse 20 is the introduction to the specific and practical ways of conducting oneself in true godliness as we see in chapter 2 to the end of the book. No wonder chapter 2 verse 1 opens by saying, first of all, then. Now, the charge to teach everyone to conduct themselves in the household of God in true godliness is so important, not only because it came from Paul, whose ministry was authentic and apostleship authoritative, but also because rejecting it is so dangerous that one risks shipwrecking their faith. By keeping this charge, however, Timothy would be able to wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. Now, with this introduction in mind, we now ask, how should God's people conduct themselves in God's household? How should God's people conduct themselves in God's household? Now, the first thing we find from this passage is that God's people must pray for all people so that they may lead a peaceful and quiet life. Chapter 2 verse 1 to verse 8. God's people must pray for all people so that they may lead a peaceful and quiet life. Now, in this section, we clearly see that conducting oneself in true godliness means and takes constant communication with God through thanksgiving, making requests, and intercession. But instead of self-centered prayers for believers only, which could have been prompted by the self-centered, truth-twisting, fierce wolves, members of God's household were to be devoted to supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings for all people, even for the ruthless kings and all who were in high positions. They were not just to pray for everyone because it was convenient. They were to do this so that they may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way, the very thing that is good and pleasing in the sight of God. For in verse 1 to verse 3, we read that, First of all, then, I add that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, 
for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior. The point here is therefore very clear. God's people must pray for all people in order that they may live a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way, which is indeed good and pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior. Such lives pleases God for it produces a favorable atmosphere for the spread of the gospel, causing people to come to the knowledge of the truth and be saved through Christ the Mediator, who gave himself as a ransom, as we see in verse 4 to verse 6. In verse 7, Paul re-emphasized the authenticity of his ministry and the authority of his apostleship, for he had been appointed and entrusted with the task of teaching the Gentiles the message of salvation through Christ, the mediator between God and men. As we have seen, these God's people are to pray for all people in order that they may live a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Instead of self-centered uh, prayers, God's people are to pray for all people. Instead of anger and quarreling that could have been prompted by the myths, genealogies, bubbles, and contradictions uh, by the uh, self-centered truth-twisting fierce wolves, men were called to pray from pure and sincere hearts, what Paul will call lifting holy hands. And now, how are God's people to conduct themselves in God's household in true godliness that springs from the sound doctrine? As we have seen in this section, God's people were to pray for all people with sincerity and purity of hearts in order that they may live a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. And friends, what does this mean for us today? As God's people, we must neither give in to anger and quarreling caused by false teachers, nor to selfishness in our prayers. Ours is a clear call to pray for all people. We must pray for our leaders, whether we like them or not. For through our prayers, we are able to live a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. But if I may ask, as a local congregation, or even as individuals, when was the last time we prayed for the president, his deputy, the cabinet secretaries, the governors, the senators, the MPs, the MCS, the opposition leaders, the church leaders, the believers, and even the unbelievers? When was the last time we prayed for all people? Friends, if we are pleased by what pleases the Lord, then we will pray for all people that we may live a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Through our prayers, a conducive environment for the spread of the gospel and the growth of the church, both in depth and in width, is indeed created. Conducting ourselves in true godliness that springs from the sound doctrine involves praying for all people that we may live peaceful and quiet lives for a conducive environment for the spread of the gospel and the growth of the church. And as gospel workers, we must teach God's people to pray for all people that we may live a peaceful and quiet life for a conducive environment for the spread and the growth of the, the church. We must pray and teach people to pray for all people that you may live peaceful and quiet lives for a conducive environment for the spread of the gospel and the growth of the church. Friends, this is one of the things it takes and means to conduct ourselves in a true godliness that springs from the sound doctrine. And as we saw in the introduction, this charge is so crucial that by keeping it, we are able to wage the good warfare, but by rejecting it, we are risking shipwrecking our faith. And so the question is, will we pray for all people 
and teach everyone to pray for all people. Will we? And friends, the second thing we see from this passage is that women must dress modestly and learn quietly with all submissiveness. As we see in chapter 2, verse 9 to verse 15. Now, we continue to ask the question, how should God's people conduct themselves in God's household in true godliness that spring from the sound doctrine? Here, Paul, who has clearly proved the genuineness of his faith, the authenticity of his ministry, and the authority of his apostleship, turned to the women to direct them on how they ought to behave in the household of God. He gave two directives for the men, uh, for the women rather. The first directive is that women must dress modestly, and the second one is that women must learn quietly with all submissiveness. Let us explore the first one. Women must dress modestly. Now, Paul made it clear that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control and not with braided hair, jewelry, and costly attire. The point here is not that women should not braid their hair, but instead shave. Of course, they can shave if they like. But the point here is not that they should not braid their hair, but instead shave and put on cheap clothes. No, the point here is that they should dress modestly with the decency and self-control and to clothe themselves with the good deeds. Rather than giving in to self-image, attention-seeking, and fashion display that could have been promoted by the false teachers, godly women were to dress modestly in God's household. And friends, what does this mean to us today? Paul's call for uh, women is as fresh to us today as it was then. For even in such a fashionistic era like ours, the ladies amongst us must dress modestly with all decency and self-control in the household of God. This will prevent unnecessary evils like lust and envy and provide a favorable environment for the growth of God's people in God's household. For the ladies who are here, your dress is not your choice. It is the choice of him who bought the church by his own blood. Therefore, you must dress as a will, modestly and with the decency and self-control. It is by so doing that you will be conducting yourselves in true godliness. As you put on uh, that next dress, then the question must be, is this modest and decent for one who profess godliness? Is this modest and decent for one who profess godliness? And to all of us who are gospel workers, we must teach everyone to dress modestly with decency and self-control, for it is one of the practical ways to conduct ourselves in the household of God in true godliness. As we saw in the introduction then, this charge is so crucial that by keeping it, we will be able to wage the good warfare, holding on to faith and a good conscience. And friends, other than women um, dressing modestly, Paul had the second charge, which is women must learn quietly with all submissiveness. Women must learn quietly with all submissiveness. After making it clear how godly women should dress, Paul then moved to the second way they should conduct themselves in the household of God. The women were neither to teach nor to exercise authority over a man in the household of God. Instead, they were to learn quietly with all submissiveness. This was how conducting themselves in true godliness would look like. Against the false teaching that, could, that seemingly permitted women to teach, the authoritative Paul wrote this section to restore things to order. Now, were women not to teach and exercise authority over men during that point in history, hence Paul's command 
cultural or could it be that women were not were not learned so they were not competent enough to teach or could it be that paul was simply biased not a fan of women or was it simply that church tradition then um it was a church tradition that women were not to teach why did paul give this command was it because it was cultural or because women were not learned or paul was not a fan of women or the church uh, the church tradition did not allow women to teach friends questions on whether paul's command resulted from cultural influence competence concerns pauline's biasness or church tradition are indeed good questions unfortunately paul did not leave us to speculate his reason for giving this command he made it so clear in verse 13 and verse 14 for in this verses we read that for adam was formed first then eve and adam was not deceived but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor from these verses it's clear that paul's charge was not based on culture competency biasness or tradition no his reason was rooted firmly in the order of creation and confirmed by the fall in genesis according to the perfect order man should be the head lovingly exercising godly authority and the woman should joyfully submit to the authority of godly man we however live at a time when both authority and submission have been corrupted by sin that authority is viewed as domineering and submission seen as weakness viewed for what god meant it to be men leading and women submitting in a godly home and in god's household is a beautiful thing to be desired and it is in accordance to god's perfect will it is in accordance to god's perfect order and god's perfect word dear friends if paul's charge for the women here was rooted neither on culture nor competency neither biasness nor tradition but on god's perfect order of creation and confirmed by the fall then it must be an authoritative timeless universal charge for all women and let me say this again if paul's charge for the women here was rooted neither on culture nor competency neither on biasness nor tradition but on god's perfect order of creation as confirmed by the fall then it must be an authoritative timeless universal charge for all women now in the midst of cultural shifts absolute for a feministic movements campaigns on gender equality equal access to education growing democracy tolerance and inclusivity in certain congregations god's plan and god's order must and will stand the women must neither teach in a local congregation nor exercise authority over men instead they must learn quietly with all submissiveness as a way of conducting themselves in true godliness that spring from the sound doctrine now this may not uh, sound fair and appropriate especially in the 21st century unfortunately the local congregation is not our households where we do all that are convenient culturally accepted and traditionally allowed no the local congregation is the household of god in which we must conduct ourselves in accordance to the order of god and the word of god now someone may ask should a women teach in a local congregation when given permission by the elders provided they teach with all submissiveness the answer is no from this passage it does not depend on the elders permission it depends on god's order of creation and confirmed by the fall
this must be very unpleasant to swallow. But we must remember that it was the first thing that even Satan himself attacked when man neglected, neglected his God-given leadership role, which was then assumed by the woman. And as part of the curses, the woman uh, will always want to take the man's position and rule over him. But still, for the godly people, God's order must stand in God's household. But was it only women who are not to teach in a local congregation? And I hope you are noting the word I keep using, local congregation. And so was it only women who are not to teach in a local congregation? No, false teachers were to be stopped and only men who are qualified to be deacons and overseers were to teach in the household of God, which is the local congregation, as we will be seeing next week. And so, does it mean that women have no role to play in the household of God? Not at all. As John Piper, um, while talking about this passage, puts it, no man or woman should sit on the sidelines of Christian ministry. Women indeed have an amazing responsibility to teach younger women, as Paul directed in Titus, to teach without exercising authority in those meetings out of the local congregation and to raise godly offsprings through which they are saved if they continue in faith and love and the godliness with self-control, as we see in verse 15. Of course, they are not saved from the wrath of God, but from the guilt of leading the whole human race into sin. Though they led the whole human race uh, to sin, they will be rescued from the shame through childbearing and managing their homes if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Let the women, therefore, like Timothy's mother and grandmother, bring up their children in faith. And as Paul will urge in Titus, let the women be devoted to teaching younger women and let them teach like Priscilla out of the local congregation without exercising authority. While commenting on the same passage, John MacArthur said, and I quote, Submission of the women was not invented by Paul. It is rooted in the nature of sexes and confirmed by the fall. And therefore, no daughter of Eve should follow the example of Eve to lead. Women led the whole race into sin, and God has given her the responsibility of leading the whole race out of sin by raising godly offspring if she continues in faith and self-control. He continues to say that the punishment of sin was pain in childbearing, the result of childbearing is her deliverance from the stigma of her sin. The pain reminds her that reminds her of that sin, but the result reminds her of God's restoring grace and puts her back into a place where she makes positive contribution to the godliness of the next generation. End of quote. And now we ask. How should women conduct themselves in the household of God in a true godliness that springs from the sound doctrine? You can boldly answer with me that women must learn quietly with all submissiveness in the household of God. And this is indeed how an ideal biblical church must look like. And so we ask, how should women conduct themselves in the household of God? And we are saying the women must learn quietly with all submissiveness in the household of God. And this is how an ideal biblical church must look like. Now, what does this mean to us? I know it has aroused so many questions within us. And you may want to, to think of many scenarios where this should not apply, or why Paul was wrong, or even why Kevin may be wrong on this. Unfortunately, 
the charge transcends all reasons and possible scenarios, for it is rooted in God's perfect order of creation and confirmed by the nasty fall. And so for the women among us, God has given you an amazing opportunity to be involved in the salvation of his people, not only by raising godly offspring, but also by teaching and discipleship for those young girls and women in their millions, as well as teaching without exercising authority in those occasions out of the local congregational meetings. And so before uh, you think about teaching in a local congregation, which is prohibited here, or suggesting reasons why this should not apply to you today, how many ladies are you working with at the moment? How many Bible study groups are you conducting for those ladies? When was the last time you um, pointed those children, those youth, and even those men to Christ in those outreaches? without um, without exercising authority and doing it away from the normal congregational fellowships. When was the last time you did this? Are you living within your God-given mandate? Friends, ours is to trust and obey the word of God, even when it appears to be inconvenient. And ours is not to choose and obey only when we... We are comfortable, uh, those things that we are comfortable with. No, ours is to obey God's word wholesomely. The local congregation belongs to the Lord, and he alone determines how we ought to conduct ourselves in it. But the question is, will we listen, trust, and obey? And to the men amongst us, have you noticed the high call and the humbling responsibility that God has bestowed on us. It is not an opportunity to boast, but to be committed to faithful teaching of God's word in God's household. It is not a call to selfishly rule, but to lovingly exercise godly authority by teaching faithfully for the growth of God's people in God's household. It is also an opportunity to empower and equip the ladies and give them the chances to mentor those young girls and to lead those women Bible studies and seminars to meet those youths and children out of the normal congregational meetings to reach others with the gospel without becoming the authority as well as to raise young ones in God's ways as we grow in godliness. Friends, let the women have many, many opportunities to teach except in the gathering of the local congregation where by teaching they will be disregarding God's order and following the steps of Eve and the women in the Ephesian church who had been corrupted by the false teachings. And so friends, the calls in this passage are very clear. How should God's people conduct themselves in God's household? We have seen that God's people must pray for all people so that they may lead a peaceful and quiet life. And we have also seen that the women must dress modestly and learn quietly with all submissiveness. And these are what we have to practice in our own lives and teach others as well. And may God help us to apply them for the glory of his name. For there is no other option. This is how God intends his household to operate. This is how God wants his household, uh, people to conduct themselves in his household. And since it is his household, we have no option but to obey even if they sound unpleasant. Lord, will you cause us to conduct ourselves in your household as you wish, no matter what and, what and at whatever cost? Lord, for those of us who doubt your word, will you convince them? For those of us who cannot swallow this at their pride, may you humble them. For those who will want to obey your word at their convenience, will you rebuke them? And for those seeking more clarity, will you grant it to them?
that by the end of the day, we may be committed to praying for all people as the women dress modestly and learn quietly with all submissiveness in your household. Amen.